Captain Blood from 1935 was an exciting, swashbuckling film starring Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland. Features some thrilling action, sea battles, sword fights, and is rightly considered a pirate movie classic. I'll summarize the film and then offer some closing thoughts. Well, the film begins with the credits and some incredible opening music by Eric Korngold. Speaking as a huge fan of John Williams, I love this kind of music. The soaring, romantic theme. It's, you know, a way to rouse the audience into the film. And just what a great way to start the picture. So the film opens up and it's late at night in England in 1685. A man is frantically riding on horseback to get to Dr. Peter Blood, who's this Irish physician played here by Errol Flynn. Well, the doctor gets dressed to go and makes it clear to his housekeeper that he is a man of peace now. And you know Errol Flynn has that big dandy smile and he seems to be carefree about his tasks. And he shows up and treats his friend, Lord Gildoy. He's been injured severely in a rebellion against soldiers of King James II. However, as he's there treating him, soon the king's men enter the room and they arrest everyone as traitors, including the doctor. The trial soon follows. Peter Blood appeals for his innocence, that he was merely helping his fellow man. The judge finds him guilty, and he's sent out with other men to be sold into slavery and sent to this English colony of Port Royal. After this dismal trip by sea, they arrive and they're brought out into a slave market. Now, the governor shows up, and soon the men are all going to be auctioned off. And, you know, I just have to mention, just as we're going through this film, the elaborate set pieces from the movie are just amazing. I mean, the locations of this film, they just look so good, and they really contribute to that authentic feel. I love the sets, I love the shadows, and just how everything looks so grand and big budget. It's a very well-made film, but, okay, anyhow, back to the story the men are brought out and they're auctioned off one by one and peter blood he's brought out gives this attitude as he's inspected and it's around here that colonel bishop arrives he's played by lionel atwill he's an amazing actor he's been in a bunch of films i've reviewed and with him is his young niece arabella played by very young olivia de havilland arabella sees peter blood being auctioned and bids for him and is all cheery about winning him in the auction, but, you know, Peter, he's not too pleased about this. And sure enough, he's taken off with some other slaves to work on this big Wheel of Pain. To me, it was reminiscent of the Wheel of Pain from Conan the Barbarian, and I love that corngold music here as well, as he musically describes this dreariness of the work. <laughs> Now, Peter Blood, however, is given the opportunity to help treat the governor's gout, and he does so and is able to help him out. The governor's pleased and hires him as his personal physician. Well, outside, Peter passes by Arabella, and there's a brief exchange as he speaks out smartly about the mistreatment of his fellow men. And Korngold's music is, again, so beautiful here, just highlighting the eventual romance between the two. So Peter starts to make plans for an escape, and he kind of goes through this with some of his fellow men. Now, the colonel finds Peter talking with another guy, and he's kind of suspicious. But Arabella kind of shows up around then, defends him. And the two go off on a horse ride together with the romantic music swirling, and he sneaks a kiss. Oh, the cad. <laughs> slave is grateful for all marks of favor. When you forget your slavery and go so far... Now there you're mistaken. However far this slave may go, he won't forget. After treating the governor again, Peter returns to find that his friend Jeremy, actor Ross Alexander, has been flogged severely and he remains tied up. He's in pretty rough shape. Gives him some water, tries to treat his injuries, but soon that pesky Colonel Bishop arrives again and tells him, hey, don't treat this guy. Peter snaps back at him. But the colonel's had enough, and he has his men tie up Peter instead. He's about to give him quite a thrashing when the Spanish attack. 
and they're firing their cannons, and soon their soldiers make landfall to loot and pillage. So Peter and his men realize that the ship that they had planned to escape on has sunken, so they do the next best thing, and they sneak over to the Spanish ship that has just arrived, and they take control of it. They overpower the drunken sailors that are still on board the ship, and it is theirs. Now, meanwhile, a Spanish soldier arrives at the governor's office and grandly announces that they've taken control of the island for King Philip of Spain, and that they won't level the island completely if, you know, they agree to pay up. Now, the governor's not too pleased about this, but they have no choice. They have fallen to the Spaniards. Now, the Spanish soldiers they return on their boats to go back to their ship when they see the new captain of the ship, Captain Blood, who orders his men to open fire, and the boats are all scattered by cannon fire in the water along with the dynamic music, and yes, I'm going to keep going on about the music of the film because it's so good. Now, it, it did raise a question to me at what point Peter Blood kind of gave up on that whole Hippocratic Oath thing, you know, being a doctor, and went into full killing pirate mode, but uh, who cares? Almost an hour into the film, and the piratey goodness finally begins. And I'll start referring to Peter as Captain Blood from this point forward in the review. Well, Colonel Bishop heads over to the Spanish ship to see what's going on and discovers that, hey, all of these former slaves are all there. They've taken over the boat. And he's all like, well, once you return, I'll see that you have reduced sentences. And yeah, he just, he doesn't get it at all. The men there, they're all angry. They want to hang him or blast him with a cannon. But Captain Blood says to just toss him overboard. And they do so, and they all get a good laugh as he flounders out in the ocean. So we kind of move into the next section of the film where Captain Blood is in charge. He's got that big cheesy smile and enthusiasm, and he's barking out the commands, and all the men sail to freedom. But there is that moment as he thinks about Arabella, and well, can you blame him? It's Olivia de Havilland, after all. But off they go for their piratey adventures. And Captain Blood here defines a charter, saying that they are men without a home, and that they will be hunted, and now they will become the hunters. He writes out these articles that say how everyone will share in their wealth, and if somebody loses a limb, they'll be paid extra, and if anyone steals from their wealth, well, they'll just be left on an island, and so on. Now, I think this was a reference to the real-life pirate charter that pirate Henry Morgan drafted, but more on that at the end of the film. Captain Blood and his men, they make a series of attacks. They're victorious, and they bring terror across the sea. He doles out his money to the men and the crew. They all seem content with his leadership. He's a natural at this pirate gig. Well, their crew heads to the famous pirate island of Tortuga, where the movie says, where easy money consorted with easy virtue, for some rest and relaxation. Well, the crew of Captain Blood, they meet up with the crew of the French captain, Levasseur, who's played here by the always incredible Basil Rathbone. And the two captains are just hanging out, and they strike up a partnership to work together. But towards the end, Captain Blood seems to think that might have been a mistake teaming up with this guy. Well, Captain Levasseur overtakes an English ship and takes Arabella and Lord Willoughby, actor Henry Stevenson, prisoner. His crew and Captain Blood's crew meet up on this island, and Captain Blood sees the lovely Arabella again and offers to pay for her with a handful of pearls. You know, the ironic switcheroo, since she had earlier purchased him. Well, frustrated, this Levasseur demands a fight, and he and Captain Blood engage in an awesome sword fight by the ocean. It's really great, but of course, Captain Blood's going to win this one. <laughs> Captain Blood and his crew leave. They bring captives Arabella and Lord Willoughby with them. Now, Captain Blood spends some time alone with Arabella, but she seems disinterested in his ill-gotten treasure. And the captain, annoyed, orders the crew to set course for Port Royal to bring them back. And his men are initially reluctant about this. They don't want to go back there. It's dangerous, but they eventually support him. 
Now, as they get close to Port Royal, they see that there's this massive battle raging. Whatever could be going on? Well, it's here that Lord Willoughby reveals that England and France are at war, and King James II has been removed and replaced by King William and that Willoughby is there with the authority to pardon Captain Blood and his crew. Well, quite the predicament. Will they turn from their piratey ways and rise up at this glorious moment to fight the French with awesome fervor for the glory of England? Will Captain Blood and the fair Arabella ever know true love? Well, you need to watch the exciting conclusion of the film for yourself to see. So some closing thoughts here. Captain Blood was directed by Michael Curtiz of Casablanca fame, and it looks tremendous. It is a very beautifully made film. It was based on the novel by Raphael Sabatini. Around this time frame in the mid-1930s, MGM was producing Mutiny on the Bounty, and Warner Brothers wanted in on this kind of film. So they decided to make this movie at the same time. Studio head Jack Warner took a chance here and brought in Errol Flynn, who was fairly unknown at this time. He was an Australian actor, but this would be his first starring role in Hollywood. Errol Flynn is, of course, fantastic in this movie as that over-the-top, grinning pirate hero. You know, he's just, he's wonderful to watch, his antics, his humor, and his sword-fighting ability. And it's interesting that during this film, he was actually plagued with malaria <laughs> since his time in New Guinea. It's crazy to think that he was doing this film while suffering with that illness. I even read that when the studio nurse told him that the filming would have to stop for the day, he left the set, downed a bottle of brandy, and returned to work. <laughs> okay. Now, I wanted to make a note. You know, when I do these old movie reviews, I do read some of the background and bios of old film stars. And, well, Errol Flynn definitely had a pretty wild private life of debauchery and indulgence. He even died young at the age of 50. I don't deny any of that wild history, but at the same time as I do this channel, I don't really like to dig into the seedy details of the past. I mean, heaven knows I've watched enough William Holden movies, and he's got quite a sordid past as well. But look, I don't get into that stuff. I just try to appreciate these old legends of Hollywood as these very excellent entertainers, and I just kind of leave it at that and go from there. You know, I've got some links below to some bios on the Internet Archive, if you want to read for yourself. The supporting cast to this film was all wonderful as well. Olivia de Havilland was very new to cinema here at only 19 years old, and she and Errol Flynn would go on to star in eight movies together. I thought Basil Rathbone as that over-the-top Levasseur character was a great rival pirate. You know, he's not strictly a bad guy per se, but rather just a competing adversary who, after the failed partnership with Captain Blood, leads us to that amazing sword fight, one that obviously reminded me of the sword fight from Adventures of Robin Hood. So great to see the two of them in battle together. And of course, Lionel Atwill was so great here as Colonel Bishop. I really love those scenes where he's on the boat and he's surrounded by Captain Blood and his crew, and he's just so completely oblivious as to how much everyone hates him. <laughs> I'll see you all get your pardon, you know even though the crew's ready to, like, completely kill him. And it's up to the grinning mercy of Captain Blood, where he just gets thrown overboard instead. <laughs> it's such a great scene. The ship battle scenes, I thought, looked great in this film, and it was really fascinating to read that no full-size ships were used in the sea battles. It was all made with a combination of process shots, some miniatures, and even footage from an old silent film, The Seahawk, from 1924. And yes, I know I mentioned the music repeatedly, and Eric Korngold's score brought so much color and energy to the film. You know, I've been listening to a lot of the music from the film Isolated, and I have some links below. It's so good. Apparently, he had only three weeks for scoring this film. And because of the limited time, he used portions of two tone poems by Franz Liszt for some of the action scenes. So because of this, he wanted to have, I guess, Franz Liszt get the credits, but he was still responsible for 90% of the score. As for the real historic character of Peter Blood, well, he was based on the historical Welsh privateer Henry Morgan. In 1922, Raphael Sabatini wrote Captain Blood, based on this famous captain. And Morgan was only a privateer for part of his life, and after many successes on the high seas, including capturing Panama, he retired and settled in Jamaica where he purchased a lot of land, and there he served as governor until his death in 1688. 
A final observation, I was in St. Augustine recently, and while there, visited the St. Augustine Pirate and Treasure Museum, which honestly was amazing. Very immersive experience. They had these incredible exhibits and displays. They even had this Blackbeard's decapitated head talking to you. I think it was done with some Disney-style animatronics, but in any case, part of this museum included a section of Hollywood pirate props, and one of the displays featured an outfit that was actually worn by Errol Flynn from Captain Blood. So it was really cool to get to see that. And what can I say? It's great to go exploring old films of the past, but you know, as part of that, to actually get to see some of the authentic props from that film. Well, that's something else as well. Anyhow, that's my review of Captain Blood from 1935. An excellent pirate film. It's a great seafaring adventure with Errol Flynn. It's got sea battles, soaring music, romance, and everything you'd expect from a pirate film. It's a classic, and it's definitely worth checking out.